I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, host of Higher Education Today. Welcome back to the education program that connects you to contemporary issues, people, and institutions involved in the world of higher education. Today's show about gerontology is thanks to UDC-TV and Curry College here in Milton, Massachusetts, where we're taping today's program with the assistance of students at CC8, which is the campus television station. Our guests today are two professors here at Curry. Dr. Elizabeth Carey is a professor of psychology, and Dr. Maureen O'Shea is a professor of nursing. Welcome to both of you. Hi, thank you for having us. Yes, thank you. Well, thanks for being here. Hi. Well, Liz, maybe if we can start with you. What is gerontology? Uh, gerontology is the study of aging. Um, it's basically looking at adults as they age um, throughout their lifespans. Um, the scientific um, study of, of gerontology has really evolved over time um, because of how much longer people are living. And gerontology is really very multidisciplinary. Um, it, it involves not only psychology and nursing, but we also um, look at biological issues, social issues. Uh, we look at things like communication, healthcare, policy, um, you know, finance and management. Um, so it, it incorporates numerous academic disciplines. Well, wouldn't that be an, an interesting and a difficult subject for students who are, let's say, 18 or 20 years old to do because they're, they may not have a lot of experience with people who are that age? I think it can pose some challenges, but I think uh, probably Maureen and I can both say that students are, are really kind of um, jumping into it because um, they realize that along the lines that with the age, the trends in aging that are going to be happening, that this is really an important field to study and it's going to lead to a lot of employment opportunities in the near future. Um, and so, yeah, not, not being an older person um, and not having experienced all the issues that come along with aging can be challenging. But I, I think most students are really, are really getting prepared and I think they're really interested in understanding the whole process. Well, that's an interesting point. And yeah. Maureen, you're a, you're a nurse, so I assume that you encounter these on a day-to-day -day level as well. Well, we like to have students realize the nature of the relationship that occurs with mm -hmm. the people that they encounter in a <coughs> hospital setting. And so we promote individual relationship. S a lot of students enter college wanting to make a difference every day, interacting with different people. And we like to show them that there's an opportunity to work with older adults and have meaningful experiences and encounters that help them to feel good about what they do and why they do it, interacting with these people on a regular basis. Well, and speaking of those interactions, mm -hmm. um, so how do those interactions work? So let's uh, assume that I were a student here at Curry. Would I volunteer? Would I work at a, a local senior center? Would I take classes? H how would that work here? Well, interestingly, we've recently revised our gerontology certificate minor concentration here because we realized the value of promoting the ability to offer these opportunities to students. And so a lot of students, they can volunteer in different circumstances, but what we're trying to do is promote intentional interaction, purposeful understanding that they can relate to one another. So some of the courses that we offer help them to have a broader understanding of older adults, realizing what they have in common, shared experiences throughout life that they might have together in understanding that they can help to influence them and have a positive effect in that way. So they might take a course in evidence-based practice, an approach to research, knowing that things that they will do will help the population as well as the individuals. Yeah, we've, we've actually, Maureen and I have worked very hard with our other colleagues to make some major revisions, knowing what's going to be happening, you know, by the year 2020 and the increase mm -hmm. in, in, in our aging population and the longevity that we're seeing. Um, we really need to be able to meet the needs and demands of seniors and senior services. Um, and so I think our curriculum actually kind of reflects that. We've worked very hard to make it, you know, current with what research has said and, and also what the demands of our students, what our students are really good at and what, what they envision themselves doing in the future. You know, so not only do we have classes where they have to study, you know, human development mm -hmm. um, and looking at, you know, the physical, the cognitive and emotional issues that happen, you know, psychologically also uh, with development, but we, we offer classes on, um, you know, death, dying and bereavement, 
so they get to understand what happens as somebody gets older and um, you know how they deal with the aging process and coming to terms with with death and, and bereaving loved ones um, we offer classes that look at cognitive changes that happen adults as they age which is very important um, being able to distinguish the difference um, you know between what's normal aging and what might not be normal aging um, understanding different um, sensory systems memory perception and when do we really need to pay attention to those those issues that might be happening um, what Maureen was saying about the internships um, part of the curriculum that the students do have to engage in an internship or in a, a clinical nursing um, internship um, so that way they're actually involved with working with you know an aging population whether it's in a community um, center or service or whether it's in a hospital so you know I think it's important that they understand aging from you know not just the theoretical orientation but also have that applied hands-on application which is so important um, you know in terms of employment you know when you graduate well, that is interesting. Yeah. Um, I wonder, as you were saying that, I was thinking yeah. about a lot of colleges and universities throughout the United States have more and more non-traditional students. Mm -hmm. So students who are not necessarily 18 to 22 years old. How do students who are older students themselves deal with this field? I, in terms of psychology, I think they, they fare very well. Um, I'm fortunate enough that I also teach continuing education classes where that population is the adults who are older, who are married, who have children, who are probably also getting ready to deal with the fact that they might have to actually care for one of their older or you know elderly mm -hmm. parents or family member. And so it really is not just an education in terms of what they're learning in the books, but it's also an education for life, for what they're, you know, whether they're gonna be going into nursing or gerontology, but also the things that they're gonna have to do in their own home. Um, you know with some of their own parents so I think they actually do very well and I think we do have a lot of older adults who are actually engaged in this um, particular area yeah and as Liz said it's very important for people maybe second careers or career changes someone might be empty nesters at mm -hmm. home in wanting to contribute to society in a meaningful way and also they benefit from learning more about the opportunities in the field Maybe they worked in finance before, but they could have a focus on financial health for older adults as well. Uh, we hear about different things that can happen to people who don't understand the meaning of managing their money well, and so they can really contribute in a, a nice way to improving the health <coughs> circumstances of older adults. Fair enough. Yeah. If I could ask both of you about the issue of other faculty members, mm -hmm. uh, because I, I think you make the, pay, the point, and make the point well that this is something interesting for a lot of students I wonder if there are ways to bring other faculty members into this and perhaps other universities and colleges could look at this as a model to bring other faculty members who aren't uh, psychologists or nurses into the uh, to the mix yeah at, we at Maureen we and Maureen and I discussed this and our actual uh, curriculum actually reflects that not only do our courses pertain to psychology and sociology and nursing but we also recommend that our students take courses in communication. So if you're, you have a passion in communication, you know, and you want to help and in, in be involved in gerontology, we also recommend that they take courses in management um, and finance um, and healthcare law and policy. So we do incorporate multiple disciplines into our existing uh, gerontology concentration. So we, you know, we also have students who are art students who want to work with an aging population and they want to do art therapy, people who are involved in the musics and dance. So um, it's not just about psychology and nursing and sociology. We do view it as being such a very broad area where multiple disciplines can, mm -hmm. can be involved. And that's what we're hoping will happen, you know, continue to happen. We, we also have a course on ethics. Mm -hmm. And so what we've tried to do is have a core group of courses that give a broad overview and then students can select other courses that will inform their particular areas of interest which we think is really nicely meshed to meet their needs as well as the needs of the population they're going to serve. And what are some of the ethical issues that keep coming up? Uh, a lot of times people may have negative stereotypes and ageism is one of those. A lot of people don't want to get old. We know that our culture really reveres youthfulness 
in being young. And so understanding that being old is not a bad thing. And so ethics that come up, many people worry about end of life. That's a really hot topic nowadays. But understanding the meaningful quality of life is, I do keep saying meaningful, but it's an important concept mm -hmm. for students to understand, for older adults to feel worth and value and dignity in their lives, and to understand that they have more in common than they don't have in common. So it's the human experience that I think brings things together. A lot of ethical issues might come in terms of older adult uh, abuse, perhaps, mm -hmm. or mistreatment. Uh, end of life issues can come up, which are all very complex, and we feel as though we're providing a lens to look at these different experiences and to determine best ways to manage them. Well, this is kind of interesting because Curry College is a pretty small college. This is not a major research university like the University of Massachusetts mm -hmm. or the University of Wisconsin. And this is a small college, but you're doing this kind of work at a small college. Well, I think that the small college actually lends itself very nicely to getting multiple disciplines because we all see and talk to each other. So we're, you know, I, I, I believe with my colleagues that we're a very close community. Um, and we share a lot of ideas, and a lot of us have the same passions. And so it's easy to have an exchange of ideas when you're in a smaller community. Um, and you know, you, you can really sit and have time to talk and take somebody else's perspective and take what they're doing in their concentration and say, hey, can we work together on this? Because that's basically what gerontology is. It's not just about psychology or nursing. Right. It's about what can we do together? How can our students learn together to actually be better prepared? So they may not be nurses, but they actually take classes and they sit and learn from nurses, just like nurses will sit in classrooms with psychology students and share ideas and maybe things that they hadn't thought of. So um, I, I think it lends itself very nicely, to be honest, yeah. And where we're situated, we have the opportunity mm -hmm. in local communities as well as the broader urban area to get involved in many different activities and opportunities. So we take full advantage of that and have established a lot of relationships that work out very nicely for both sides. We call it mutually beneficial or win-win. Yeah. Yeah. Well, is this a growing area around the country? I would say it's definitely a growing area. Just no one can deny that the population is aging. And as we have older adults, we have less people in the younger segments of the population able to be there. So whether we want to or not, sometimes it's referred to as a silver tsunami coming forward, the aging population. Mm -hmm. And so other areas of the country are indeed addressing the same concerns about housing, population management, in trying to identify needs, anticipate them, and address them. So just to kind of address that a little bit further, yeah. and I like this, the silver tsunami, yeah. um, to put it in perspective, right now we're in the sixth, the sixth year of the baby boomers, who mm -hmm. are basically turning 65 at the rate of 10,000 per day across the nation. Yes, 10,000 per day across the nation, people are turning 65. Um, but not only that, they anticipate by the year of 2020 that um, the, the, the aging population is gonna increase by almost 40%. I work very closely with a lot of outside agencies in one particular community. Um, right now they service 7,901 seniors. By 2020, they're anticipating servicing over 13,000 seniors. So there is a big jump in the services that they are going to have to provide and the people that they're going to need to provide those services. And also the minority population is going to make up over half of that. Um, so right now we're, we're dealing with three generations. We're dealing with the greatest generation, those 85 and older. We're dealing with the silent generation, those that are 67 to 84. And then we have our baby boomers who are you know 56 to, to 65 years old. So that's three very different populations who have three very different needs. And there's really not like one technology or one particular service that is going to be able to meet the needs of all of these different aging populations. So it, it is very, very demanding. Um, and, and gerontology is certainly, um, once again, it's, it's an area where there's a lot of growth and there's going to be a lot of need for people to, to supply those services. <coughs> Well, and speaking of the growth, um, can you put this in some context? Mm -hmm. How many people over the age of, you used the benchmark of 56, how mm -hmm. many people over 56 are there in the state of Massachusetts and then in the country? Um, I Approximately. Don't, uh, yeah, I don't know that. I know in Massachusetts the, the age 
the average age of, of the elder that's receiving services is 80.7. Um, and but I can't I'm sorry I don't know the specific demographics of between 80 to 56 it is a 10 percent of the population is it 20 percent of the population roughly what percentage of our population are we talking about here well it, to look come at that from a different angle we do know that generally speaking five percent of the older adult population is in a nursing home setting and what that tells us is 95 percent of the population is not in a nursing home mm -hmm. setting and understanding that there still may support of services be available, most people want to remain in their home, in their local community, and so bringing services in or having community housing se settings for them with services that will keep them going is a really important concept. Uh, nursing home care I think is going to change a lot in the next few years because it seems to be a last stop and a dreaded last stop. One of the things we do is promote engagement with older adults in the community so that they don't all, so that students don't have a negative perception of aging in older adults. Mm -hmm. And we think that's an important perspective. Well, that is interesting because if you think about the intergenerational difficulties that occur even every five years, mm -hmm. uh, now you're dealing with uh, uh, college students, many of whom may not know a lot of people who are over the age of 85. So that must make for some interesting interactions. And so a lot of college students will have if not parents, then grandparents, aunts and uncles, or other relatives. But uh, one thing that Liz had mentioned earlier was in the uh, setting that people live, it used to be multi, multiple generations in one household, and that's occurring less often. A lot of older adults live alone by themselves, so students may visit and interact, but there aren't the same close bonds that there might have been at another time. And so we promote engagement, interaction. They we do activities that promote understanding of one another. Mm -hmm. For example, in terms of uh, stereotypes, there are a lot of greeting cards out there that people look at, and it's all about nobody wants to get old, you're over the hill at 25, oh no, what does 40 mean, 50? And there's a lot of jokes about older people and bodily functions. And we bring students and older adults together to look at these cards, to l explain them to one another in hoping for a shift in perspectives. Not all older adults are offended by these cards, and students are worried that they will be, and yet they talk about it, some laugh about it, some not, and they can see the individual response to cards and understand that not everyone has those perceptions or feels that way, and yet ageism, unless we address it, it's going to be an accepted part of society. Well, you said before that roughly 5% of the American mm -hmm. population is in a nursing home. Of older adults. Of older yeah. mm -hmm. well, but roughly, if we have 300 million Americans, more or less, mm -hmm. how many people are over the age of 65? And you would think we would have that number right with us. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. Uh, well, I, I think that would be yeah. interesting, but I bet it's not an insignificant number. Uh, well, we do know the number's increasing as time goes on, it, the increased proportion. So I would say roughly 25% are older than age 65 yeah. and so understanding that and then the oldest old when people turn 65 they're more likely to be able to make it into their 80s so the longer you live the more likely that you're going to live further and so we, the services as Liz had yeah. mentioned yep. for the different populations need to address particular issues because a 60 year old or a 65 year old has different needs than a 90 year old and typically over the age of 65, uh, we find that most uh, people are, are really living with at least one chronic condition, if not more, but they don't want to, you know, move into assisted living and they don't want to move into a nursing home, that they'd rather stay home and, you know, maintain their independence. And so that's very, very important. And again, at the rate of, you know, it's turning 65 at 10,000 a day, um, there's a lot of people that need services within the comfort of their own home um, in order so that they can live longer lives, happier lives. Um, you know, longevity is a, is a, is really um, a very interesting study right now because people are living longer than they ever have. Um, and so there's a lot of different things that happen to the body as you live longer, to your, to your physical, to your, you know, to your immune system, your cardiovascular system, to what happens up here, to the brain as you age. And so we have to be prepared to help people deal with not just one thing. You know, when you talk about aging, it's talk about dealing with all of the different things that happen when you age. Yeah. Well, I imagine those must be quite difficult to yeah. deal with, especially, uh, let's say, you're a freshman here at Curry. Mm -hmm. 
and you just started college and you're excited to be here at, 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 at college yeah. and then all of a sudden you take one of your classes yeah. and then somehow you get involved in this and you meet a bunch of people who are in their 70s and 80s, that must be quite a cultural shift for that student. I, you know, I'm going to say it is, but um, they actually develop a very positive attitude and, and I notice with my students that they really develop a, a, a much broader sense of empathy for aging. Um, and they become really invested in what they're doing. And the other thing that happens that I think is very interesting is that stereotypes change, but not just with the student. I find that mm -hmm. the seniors that the students work with also have stereotypes about working with a younger population. So their stereotypes, you know, about younger people just don't care and mm -hmm. they just do what they want and care about themselves. So they actually change their stereotypes about how college students are. Um, so it works both ways, yeah. Do you ever invite some of the people from the senior centers that you work with to come on campus and do things here mm -hmm. rather than have the students just go there? Yeah, we, we actually do both. Um, I'm the psychology department, I'm the internship coordinator, so I do a lot of on-campus experiences. Um, so I do like to bring the, the population from local senior centers to sit and to engage with our students. Um, we invite them to lunch. We, you know, we, we do a little bit of education. Mm -hmm. um, we have a couple of assisted living facilities that are very close by. So a lot of Curry faculty actually go and um, do lectures and teach um, because they're so very engaged still and their minds are very sharp and people want to learn. Um, so we, we do both. Yeah, we have both experiences. And in, in the nursing department, I have a course called Nursing Care of Older Adults. In very similar, mm -hmm. we have students go there, uh, but we promote more of a social engagement rather than a clinical aspect yep. of things in understanding that they're there to, in a professional manner, but it's not all about vital signs, monitoring health status. Mm -hmm. It's more comprehensive uh, social, emotional aspects of care. And it's really a nice thing to watch relationships evolve over time. We typically go there about four to six times in a semester to this uh, place, and yet they love coming here to Curry as well. And they go to the student center, they sometimes go to some of the music events that occur. Yep. So it's really nice to yeah. have all of that engagement and opportunity. Well, and, and speaking of that engagement, how do you want them to, how do you want the local residents to engage with Curry who perhaps are thinking about taking advantage of the resources here, but perhaps haven't? Are there ways that local members of the community could take advantage of what's going on at Curry? Uh, there's many opportunities to attend all of the different functions that we have here. We have a very active theater department. Uh, our art department, fine arts department does a lot of different things. Um, I think they can come and uh, attend classes as well yeah. or different mm -hmm. uh, events that events we have on campus. Events and classes that we have on mm -hmm. campus, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, a number of universities, if I'm not mistaken, have, try, have come up with ways to serve that community, <laughs> the older community, for lack of a better term, as students themselves mm -hmm. and for, uh, for continuing education uh, because the, a lot of colleges view this as a growth area. Am I misperceiving that? Or? No, no, I think, it, I think again, our continuing education department is open to, yeah. to anybody. And I, and I do find, um, right now I'm teaching a particular health psychology class, and most of the students in that class are older adults who fit this criteria. Um, they are empty nesters, their children are out, their children have already graduated from college, mm -hmm. and they're exploring maybe their second or third profession. And they always thought it would be very interesting to study health psychology. Um, and, uh, and also they're, they're maybe learning a little bit something about themselves. Um, so I find uh, out of my class that majority of the, the students that actually take my class are older adults and I absolutely love it. Um, just because the, they're, they're not shy, they're patient, they're engaged. Um, the younger students in the class sometimes don't know what to make of it um, because they don't, they're not used to having a lot of older adults but I pair them up they share their experiences and, and they both learn a lot from each other. Um, you know, uh, risky sexual behavior happens in a college population and it happens in an adult population, a geriatric population. So um, young students think that as you age, you stop having sex. Well, you don't stop having sex. Um, and, and, and so it, it, it's interesting and, and they actually learn an awful lot from each other. A lot of very interesting conversations happen, yes. 
besides <laughs> that subject? What yeah. other interesting conversations keep coming up? Well, I, th I too, uh, you know, uh, all sorts of health issues, but one of the things that kind of struck me is we were actually talking about, um, you know, when your bodies get older and, you know, and you have the physical manifestation, so you get the wrinkles and things don't fight, go where they used to go and those kind of things, your skin sags. Um, but women, uh, older women, are still very concerned with their appearance and it really bothers them. And I think mm -hmm. the young women find that they, they hope that when they get to a particular age that they don't have to worry so much about that and they're actually surprised that you know older women do care about their appearance and they're still body conscious and it still bothers them um, you know that they don't want to wear the short sleeve shirts because they might have some extra skin or you know that they can't wear the clothes that they used to and they don't still feel comfortable and and so there's a lot of commonalities mm -hmm. that come out yeah so again it makes for some pretty interesting conversations interesting and, yeah. so, uh, and so for you as well <laughs> right and so thinking about that and thinking yeah. about the music you know a music is an important thing to promote mm -hmm. uh, reminiscence positive feelings and so a lot of older adults will listen to music from the age when they grow up and we kind of joke and say young people who listen to rap music are they going to be listening to that when they're 70 and 80 and they may well be because that will evoke good feelings yeah. about the times that they spent at that age in their circumstances then and we know that that is always a good feeling to look back and reminisce and think about things. Well that's interesting you make mm -hmm. that point and uh, we might have to wrap this up in a minute but mm -hmm. now that you're mentioning that uh, I go to a lot of college reunions at a lot of <laughs> colleges <laughs> yes. and one of the things that's always intrigued me is the music at the different tents yes. for the different classes and right. you can actually hear mm -hmm. the different music from the different tents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's not a mistake. No, no, <laughs> it's intentional and also thinking that we do promote some responses by students to reflective prompts that they respond to to find meaning in their experiences that they have. And the older adults are very happy to also participate in the education of the students. Well, fair enough. Do either of you want to say anything else before we say goodbye? Anything else to somebody maybe thinking about coming to Curry that we haven't covered? I just think in general, I think it's very important that if you're interested in gerontology or, or geriatrics, um, that you really look for a program that not only you know offers you the theoretical important parts of it you know and, and presents it through scientific processes but also has the 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 internship opportunities and mm -hmm. the hand-on practicum that we offer here um, I think it really makes a big difference in your education no matter what discipline you are if you're actually applying what you're learning in the field those real life experiences and I think we do a very good job um, at that um, in both of our departments and, and most um, all the departments here at Curry um, we take a special pride in and making our students not just sit in the classroom but go outside of the classroom and and, and practice what they're learning well I think we're gonna have yeah. to leave it at that with the pride so right. nice comment and thank, uh, you. thank you both thank you if you would like additional information about dr. Elizabeth Curry Carey dr. Liz Carey uh, or dr. Maureen O'Shea please visit curry.edu if you have comments or suggestions about higher education today, please send an email to our viewer mailbox at highereducationtoday at topcolleges.com. And thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. Please join me again for another edition of Higher Education Today. And I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today. <laughs>